So my name is Imo Han. I uh, graduated from Cornell, uh, David Moller's group, and uh, I mainly work on 2D materials in my PhD. And then I shift the topic and I did a two-year postdoc at Princeton, uh, staying in a cryo-EM lab. So uh, this is, okay, staying in a cryo-EM lab. So the lab is doing biochemistry. They purify proteins and they make cryo-EM samples, and they take data, do the reconstruction, fit the model, and figure out the high-resolution structure of the uh, membrane protein they are working on. And uh, so that's actually very different. So I will talk about like uh, both. And because this is like um, uh, machine learning like a topic, so I also did some machine learning during the pandemic because uh, we are stuck at home. And uh, I look at my previous data from my PhD. I feel like, okay, let's just do machine learning and see whether we can solve some problems. And uh, okay, so first, I think I don't need to introduce uh, electron microscopy because um, you, you, you have been in this <laughs> like for the entire week, right? And uh, so, First, I'll talk about 4D stem stream mappings uh, techniques to study like a 2D materials, especially this uh, string, uh, sorry, string domains or like um, uh, with very high precision. So to start, I want to introduce 2D materials. This you, are, you may not be familiar with. So two-dimensional materials is a family of uh, materials that actually uh, the lattice is confined into uh, very, very thin layer. So you can see that you, uh, this is a very famous graphing, and uh, we have transition metal dichroxide, we have uh, black phosphorus, and uh, a lot of like a different uh, chemical composition. And uh, 2D materials has been uh, like a very uh, promising building block material because they have different uh, properties. Some are metallic, some are semiconducting, some has direct band gap, and uh, some has very good mechanical properties. So, uh, so people have uh, developing this uh, layer by layer technique to like put 2D materials um, uh, like uh, in the vertical dimension. And they can even engineer each layer. For example, here is an add-off stem image of nine layers 2D material uh, transferred onto a substrate layer by layer uh, with a very clean interface. And these nine layers are switching from MOS2 to WSC2 to MOS2 to WSC2 periodically. So, however, uh, in plain, connecting 2D materials has been very uh, challenging. Uh, so, when I was in my PhD, this paper, this, oh, sorry, I think, okay. So, this paper comes out, and uh, it, the, paper, the work is, like, uh, fantastic, because they can grow uh, laterally connected 2D materials with atomically sharp interface. So the method they use is called two-part CVD. They grow one uh, transition metal tetrachronide triangles, and then they take the sample out of the furnace, put it in another furnace, and then put the precursor, uh, switch the precursor, and grow another uh, like uh, 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 layer tri triangles around those ones. And these two materials are connected epitaxially. And they show a very clear out of them image showing that these two materials are atomically sharp connected to each other. However, this question comes up. So MOS2, uh, lattice constant is 3.18, and WSC2, they grow outside the MOS2, has a lattice constant of 3.32. They have a 4% lattice mismatch. That means this lattice, this atomically sharp junction cannot uh, be like this forever, right? So imagine after a few, like uh, maybe a few, like uh, uh, distance, you're gonna have something, either strain or dislocations or this thing gonna come out. So what exactly happened in this uh, junction area uh, was a mystery at that time. And uh, I contact the group. Oh, actually, let me first, for, for those who does not know uh, this architectural growth, so this is what happened in bulk materials, in 3D materials. People have a, uh, we have a substrate, and there are uh, dangling bonds, and then they float, uh, like uh, the top layer thin film starts to grow, uh, and they have different lattice constant. But if the film is very thin, they form lattice match structure. 
And the top film has a very uh, large string, uh, not necessary to be large, but has a, a string to uh, make the film uh, coherent to the substrate. But imagine you are growing the film much thicker, like thicker and thicker, and then the strain energy is proportional to the thickness. So at some point, uh, they're going to relax the strain and uh, start to form dislocations at the interface. So what about 2D? We observed exactly a similar structure in 2D, and this time I took atomic resolution images with a larger field of view, and then I did the geometric phase analysis, which is a very useful method to extract the strain. And in the rotation map, I see these uh, dislocations decorating the interface. And more interestingly, we observed that in 2D materials, actually, if you overgrow a little bit, these dislocations are not that stable. They climb, uh, they migrate into the WSC2 sample and form a very uh, long and narrow 1D channel embedded in this um, uh, WSC2 matrix. And uh, when we take a closer look at the structure of the channel, so this is uh, because the contrast between moly and tungsten, tungsten is much heavier than uh, moly, so that's why it, the atom shows much brighter. And oops, okay, so uh, this is the 1D channel, and we focused on this tip and we see the misfit dislocations, uh, which is a pentagon heptagon misfit dislocations in the hexagonal lattice. And uh, this misfit dislocations locating at the tip, followed by a very sharp interface between the MOS2 and WSC2. And the MOS2 part is pretty narrow. And uh, if we do geometric phase analysis on this structure, okay, we see these uh, dislocations only, uh, so first of all, in the rotation map, the dislocations actually only uh, all, always at the tip of this 1D channel. And another thing is this 1D channel here has a very, uh, like it actually lattice matched this WSC2. That's why you don't see any contrast in the Y direction. But it also compressed uh, in the X direction uh, because this uh, MOS2 lattice in the 1D channel is uh, stretched and compressed in this direction. And so why this happen? How this uh, happen? So we reach out to a group who does MD simulation at MIT. And uh, we did some like, uh, 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 we, we did some simulation that we put a dislocation core here and we flow the precursor in. And we see the dislocation core is actually very reactive. It take these precursors into the dislocation core and push this dislocation upwards, rearrange the lattice and push the dislocation upwards. And uh, it does that like continuously because it's a 2D layer. So there's precursor everywhere. It's like taking precursor all the time. And that will push the dislocation migrates upwards zigzag in a zigzag direction and form this 1D channel. So uh, that's why in 2D materials, this 1D channel can form uh, in a very long uh, aspect ratio, uh, large uh, aspect ratio, uh, because it's taking the precursor from the environment continuously. And uh, we made an analogy that we are drawing lines on 2D materials where the dislocation core actually serve as the pen tip and your precursor atoms in the environment, in the growth furnace serve as the ink. And uh, another interesting thing is we observe this branching effects of uh, branching effects in the Adolf Stem image. Originally, I thought this is like um, adding additional dislocations, but it turns out in the geometric phase analysis, there's no dislocation here. It's actually the original dislocation split into two partial dislocations and continue to migrate and form 1D channels. So that's why we are uh, having this uh, Y channel shape in, in, the, uh, in the 2D material. And uh, uh, if you look at the Burgers vector, because these two partial dislocations are split from the original one, the Burgers vector are conserved, and uh, we, uh, this uh, splitting uh, does not introduce additional like uh, lattice distortion around this area. So it's still uh, the, 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 like, uh, the same, like um, uh, uh, if you look at the Burgers circuit, it's still the same around this area. And, um, 
Another observation is when we have a low angle green boundary in 2D materials, uh, we know low angle green boundary can be like an array of dislocations such as this one. And uh, when we flow the precursor and uh, grow uh, this MIS2, uh, while there is a low angle green boundary, what we observed is this boundary going to migrate collectively and form an array of 1D channels. So this is a larger field of view um, out of stem images. And uh, this is a 9 degree green boundary uh, in WSE2. And we see these uh, branches. And if you zoom in here, there's an array of 1D channel um, super lattice embedded in WSE2 uh, formed because of the green boundary. And it actually migrated the green boundary from, this is the original green boundary. But now the green boundary uh, moves to here. So after this work, and uh, this is a very special case because growing atomically sharp uh, interface uh, lateral heterojunction is very difficult. Most of the case, when people use CVD to grow, they actually form graded, graded junctions. So the transition is not atomic sharp. It's like a transition from, for example, uh, WSE2 to WS2 uh, gradually. And uh, so this sample is grown using MOCVD. They fly this uh, gas precursor into the system. And then after growing the first uh, sample, and then they switch the gas and they continue to flow another precursor in gas phase. And this further uh, tells us you cannot form atomically sharp interface because gas has a, like a mi mixture during the growth process. And uh, for, that, uh, for that sample, um, adf stem does not work because we're uh, limited by this um, uh, field of view. Uh, so this is a, a interface I can basically rarely find in adf stem, and the the uh, the, uh, the contrast is dominated by tungsten here. Uh, but if you look closely, okay, maybe this is tungsten disilinite, this is tungsten sulfide interface here, no dislocations. So what happened in the system? So uh, at that time. So in David Muller group, and the first MPAD has been uh, built, and the people are eager to try their samples in using MPAD. So I throw this sample uh, in the microscope with the MPAD, and I actually collect the data uh, with a very small convergence angle. So we have a separate disks, and we can see the uh, mirror the crystal like uh, 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 parameters. And uh, I, I guess I don't need to uh, mention too much about 4D stem. We scan the beam and take diffraction patterns. And uh, then the sample here is actually a multi-junction. It's a monolayer. And we have, uh, uh, so here, we have the switching between different 2D materials. And it's a monolayer. And they have different lattice parameter. So we collect data using 4D stem, and uh, we see on the amorphous uh, substrate is amorphous like um, uh, ring shows up, and on the sample area you start to see the diffraction pattern very nicely. So one thing I really appreciate for this uh, MPAD is that it has a really high dynamic range. So we get this uh, center beam uh, very well, and our diffraction beam very clear. And we can even subtract the background and uh, do some other like, uh, uh, like uh, cool things. And uh, so uh, these uh, diffraction spots, uh, the center beam are actually good enough for us to align all these diffraction patterns. Because if you scan a large uh, field of view, sometimes the beam tilt become a problem and uh, uh, your, your diffraction pattern has a drift. And uh, that's not good. So we first align using just the center of mass of the center beam. And then we can mask all these diffraction spots and then calculate the reciprocal lattice vectors. So here's the lattice constant calculated from the uh, 40, 40 data. And uh, this sample is middle is uh, WS2. And uh, between that is this uh, yellow area, is WSE2. And uh, outside the third, uh, like uh, I wouldn't call it layer, the third um, like a uh, part is the WS2 again. And you can see the lattice constant, they are very different. And uh, they have uh, 3.1% lattice mismatch in this sample. So if you remember, the lattice mismatch should be 4%. And that means some residual strain or something in the material. 
And uh, we did this uh, polar decomposition of this uh, reciprocal uh, lattice vectors to see the strain and the rotation. So in the strain map, we see most of the strain are actually relaxed. And the rotation map tells us where the dislocations are. So now, if we zoom in, we see, OK, uh, there are dislocations in the sample, but they are almost like 100 nanometer apart from each other. And that is why we didn't see it very uh, quite often in LF stem images. And uh, another thing is um, this sample, the outside uh, WS2 part, has a small rotation in the lattice. We believe that also contributes to uh, the strain uh, relaxation. And I want to highlight this because uh, sometimes rotation is important if it's related to the sample structure. So if you do like a rotation invariance, then sometimes this feature gonna be <laughs> gonna be disappeared. You need to really look at the rotation and see, okay, this is useful, that's not useful, and uh, to do the analysis. So, and uh, okay, we can continue. So we have this 100 nanometer spacing between um, misfit dislocations, and this rotation actually. Uh, uh, like a cause additional dislocations for me, uh, mainly in the WS2 uh, part. And uh, here's a question comes up. So we have a 3.1% uh, lattice mismatch. And that means if you do the math, and that means we should have a, a 10.3 nanometer dislocation spacing. However, what we observed is a 100 nanometer spacing between dislocations. So there must be something else contribute to the strain relaxation. So it turns out we're in 2D. So 2D materials can easily buckle up and form ripples. And uh, so we uh, use this method uh, to probe ripples, where it was like published uh, quite a long time ago that 2D materials can never be flat. They have some fluctuations. And that will cause the reciprocal, uh, that will cause the diffractions in diffraction space is not the perfect round shape. It becomes like a corn shape. And then if you have a tilt, your inner sphere is going to cut uh, the, this area, which means a broaden of the peak, uh, diffraction peak. And uh, so we probe this uh, broadness using second moment. And I uh, calculate the second moment of A, B, and C. Uh, here and uh, uh, put uh, our value here so that we also know the orientation of this um, uh, this uh, this vector and uh, then we can see the ripple structure in the WSE2 uh, area and there actually looks quite nice because we uh, in the corner they are kind of bridging these two WSE2 um, edges and between WS2 and uh, here, they are like a perpendicular to the interfaces. And uh, if we overlay the ripple with the dislocation map, the purple means the dislocation. So I just like highlighted in uh, one color. And then the ripple are white. And we see when you have a lot of ripples, you don't have much dislocations. And when you start to see dislocations, uh, there's not a lot of ripples anymore. So these two are actually competing mechanism uh, to release the lattice strain. So this is our uh, discovery. And uh, we looked at this uh, junction that there are, the, the WSC2 are uh, very wide. It's about 400, even 500 nanometer. And uh, what if the junction is uh, narrower? So for this uh, narrow junction, uh, smaller than like 100 nanometer, we, see, we observed that they have a very strong uniaxial strain in the WSC2 part. And uh, they actually uh, form coherent structure. So this is the, uh, the, the string map along uh, this orientation. And this, along this direction, the lattice spacing are the same, are almost the same. So you don't see uh, much contrast. And if you look at the rotation map, we do have uh, one, two, three dislocations in the entire map, which uh, in the entire triangle, which is about like a several micrometer. So, this is almost dislocation free, and we do have a tiny ripple rippling in the WSC2 to kind of release a little bit of the strain, um, but it's not a dominant structure. Uh, 
And uh, by changing the width of the uh, ratio between WS2 and WSC2, we find we can actually fine tune uh, the electrical properties. So the PL signal actually can shift from the intrinsic WS2 all the way to intrinsic WSC2 by engineering the width of this uh, 2D lateral heater junctions. So, <clears throat> uh, as a summary of the first part, so uh, the, we are first uh, curious what happened between these uh, 2D materials when they connect laterally and form uh, epitaxial junction uh, when they have a lattice mismatch. So we figured out that, okay, they have these locations to release the strain at the interface. And more uniquely is in 2D, these dislocations can migrate and form 1D channels. And we published the uh, work in Nature Materials and we are very lucky to get the cover uh, I just like uh, put uh, I just like uh, uh, put color on the ADAF image and uh, uh, send it to the editor, and I was so surprised because David say, uh, said that I'm competing with professional photographers, so uh, electron microscopy win. <laughs> 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 yeah, and um, next is when this junction actually when this junction is graded. And uh, they don't uh, form this well-defined uh, uh, 1D channel uh, like effects in the 2D material during growth. But what we observed is that when the junction width is very narrow, uh, like narrower than 100 nanometer, they just have a very strong uniaxial strain, so they form coherent structure. But when the junction width is uh, much wider, uh, like uh, on the scale of larger than 100 nanometer or even like a 500 nanometer, and they start to ripple, and uh, to release the strain. So uh, dislocation in this case is uh, not uh, favorable because these two are competing mechanisms. Okay, the next topic is um, uh, machine learning methods. How we can use machine learning methods to help uh, this 4D stem? So, um, uh, so challenges in 4D STEM, 4D STEM are very cool studying a variety of materials now. It's become more and more popular. So people do it on not only 2D materials, also nanoparticles, metals, and uh, biological samples, and also polymers, and uh, for different types of applications. And uh, also 4D STEM generate a very large data like uh, than uh, what we used to like uh, uh, Oh, be comfortable with, like add up stem, it's just the, like uh, images. But for this stem, when we get this uh, uh, like a terabyte data back home, sometimes we don't know how to deal with it. So these are, I think these are main two uh, challenges. So for this stem give you very large data and you need a lot of prior knowledge to analyze them. So if you look at the typical workflow for for this stem data processing, so what we do is we first, oh, sorry, we first need to know our sample. And we predict the structure, and we design the mapping strategy to uh, map this, those uh, structure out from this uh, 4D uh, stem data. And I want to give an example using my previous project described this uh, nanobeam 4D stem. So first I know, okay, my collaborator grow the sample uh, when they switch the precursor, and uh, then they grow, it's a monolayer 2D materials with uh, different uh, sections that has a uh, uh, different lattice constant. And I have an adapt stem image to show me, okay, those are triangles and they have a different uh, uh, chemical composition. And the second is, I know in bulk materials, when they are narrow, when the film on top is thin, uh, they just form coherent epitaxial, like a, a, a thin film on top of a bulk substrate. But when the film are thicker, they form dislocations to release the strain. I already know that. This is written in material science textbook. And there's some like a simulation work showing, okay, 2D materials can buckle up when they have dislocations or they have like a, some like lattice distortion, they buckle up. So I know there are ripples. And then I design the strategy. I design the strategy by masking the uh, diffraction pattern I want, uh, and then uh, like uh, uh, calculating the first, like center of mass or second moments uh, to get the string and ripples out. But most of the time, the samples electron microscopy study are 
different from what they saw. So when they have the sample put it in the microscope, sometimes, most of the time actually, it's different from what you thought. And uh, there are unexpected uh, like structures and the minor effects that you would never know. Your grower does not know. You, like uh, your collaborator, they don't know like uh, uh, what's happening during the CVD growth. So um, most of the time, there are unexpected structures in your sample. And design the mapping strategy become really hard. So you don't know what you're dealing with. So I think that's the main uh, like uh, issue uh, for our study. And uh, so I discussed that during the COVID with my student. And uh, uh, so we want to come up with a method that can help us with those uh, like uh, problems. So uh, there are a few things we want to uh, uh, highlight when we, during the discussion, like how we chose the uh, this, uh, machine learning methods. So we want to uncover fine structures. So those string, those lattice distortion, repose, dislocations, they're all very uh, like uh, fine features. If you uh, just do a clustering on the lattice, you just see different uh, elements, uh, like uh, uh, lattice parameters. You cannot see uh, all these uh, fine structures. And another thing is uh, we don't want artifacts. We think our sample is complicated enough for us to uh, like uh, to to like uh, to work on. So if there's additional layer of artifacts possibility, it's gonna drive us crazy. <laughs> so that's why we uh, finally say, okay, well, let's do unsupervised learning. And uh, so uh, Xu Xiao uh, uh, adopt this approach. We just do uh, clustering hierarchically. And we have a bunch of uh, diffraction pattern input. And uh, then we do some pre-processing, we clean it up. The center beam has a very strong intensity, so it always dominates. Even the noise in the center beam dominates. So we clean the data up, we cover the center beam, and remove the noise. Uh, we tried the other like uh, uh, dimension reduction method, we tried a few. But uh, uh, actually, finally, we found just uh, masking, uh, masking out the center beam and the noise works already pretty well. It actually works the best, so we, we just keep doing this. And then we cluster them into different uh, uh, clusters, and some are like a, uh, have a smaller lattice parameter, some have a larger lattice parameter, some are amorphous or polycrystalline area or noise. And then we further cluster them. And when we continue to do that, actually after a few rounds, you start to see the minor effects uh, being picked up. So finally, we have a real space map and the manifold structure of the data or of the sample um, to uh, like show us something before we design the mapping strategy for uh, like uh, all these features. And uh, we, I used my data as the test uh, data, uh, which uh, has uh, WS2 and WSE2 and WS2 layers, and it works pretty good. So in the first round, uh, he uh, Chu Qiao can uh, show me that okay, there's three like uh, different, uh, very uh, different uh, areas, and then out in the second round, uh, he figured out okay, rotation comes up when he cluster this uh, WS2 area, and the ripples come up when he cluster this uh, WSE2 area. And uh, it actually also picked up this uh, uh, in the narrow junction, narrow super lattice uh, sample. Uh, when he clustered this WSC2, it picked up this string. And if we further do that, it picked up this uh, ripple structure. Uh, ripple is really minus in this uh, WSC2 uh, in the narrow junction super lattice sample because the uh, mostly is coherent uh, connected lattices. And uh, so basically, I spent my PhD working on this, and Chu Qiao showed me, like, after 10 minutes, he got this. I was like, okay, good. Machine learning is useful. <laughs> Actually, quite good, works quite well. And uh, after that, he told me, okay, there's another thing. If you look at the three clusters of the ripple, you see that if you, like, uh, look at the diffraction, average diffraction patterns from these three clusters, you see that it's not the broadness like uh, telling you there's a ripple, it's the intensity changes. And uh, if you see, okay, when you have different tilt axis, there's actually um, a different intensity change along uh, different directions. I said, okay, and we did some literature search and it turns out um, uh, Rabi Group published this paper in 2019 and uh, saying that, okay, in the second order spot, that's the spot we're using. In the second order diffraction, if you look at uh, MS2, 
which has three atom thick. It's not graphene, it's a one atom thick. So if you have a three atom thick 2D material, so this is not a cone shape anymore. This is like a spindle shape. So that's why when you tilt the sample, you don't see the broadness that much. You see the intensity change. And we say, okay, that's a good information. And we want to, uh, we can, maybe we can use this to quantify the ripple structure. So we uh, reach out to Ravi and uh, uh, like uh, do more, like um, uh, read, the, read his paper uh, much more carefully, and we find that his method actually matches the experimental data quite well. So uh, this is an ongoing project. So we say, okay, let's just map the ripple, like map the three D structure of two D materials using uh, the diffraction pattern using four D stem data, and we don't need to tilt the sample at all. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is another sample we got from our collaborator from uh, Kibang Kang. And uh, now he grow this, uh, uh, this is about 200 nanometer wide and it form really big ripples. And uh, we take the 4D data and we use this method matching, uh, matching to the simulation result and we map out this uh, uh, tilts of the ripple structure in, bad, uh, in this uh, WSE2 sample. And uh, so I had a discussion with Colin and <laughs> about how to quantify this. And Colin said, oh, from the tilt to the height. And he sent me some code. And we tried. Actually, I got this map yesterday from my student. We, we still need to polish that. And I blocked the number because I don't think it's correct. <laughs> and uh, so just, just to show you that it's possible. And uh, we are, we are like, uh, we're working on that. And if we compare this uh, tilt map, uh, with, the, with the result we got from AFM. AFM, we can still see the uh, repose, but the AFM, uh, the, the map suggests is about eight degree uh, tilts in the repose, and we have the 10 degree-ish. Is that um, the, some error during the process or AFM tip, just like uh, manipulating the surface of 2D materials a little bit? We don't know yet, so we're trying to figure that out. And um, okay. So that's uh, how it quantifies uh, the repos. Okay, now let me bring you back to this uh, clustering machine learning like uh, approach. So if you uh, remember, uh, like, uh, sorry, I, uh, yeah, if you remember, we were on this uh, nano super lattice on the WSE2 area, we figure out the string repos, and uh, we did the clustering on the WS2 part. And something come up very, uh, very actually very, uh, very interesting because we know for this uh, transition metal dichrogenite, uh, they have a polarity in their first order spots, and that gives you this intensity difference. But we didn't expect uh, these two has similar intensity difference, but there's a unique angle that the intensity difference is larger than the other two. And uh, if you see, uh, Chu Chao told me uh, he just uh, do run the algorithm, do the clustering, and uh, he got three clusters. And uh, if you look at the symmetries, like uh, one along this direction, the intensity difference is much higher than the other two, and one is along this direction, and one is along this direction. And I was so curious. I said, okay, what is that? And uh, if, you, if you do like, for example, cluster zero minus cluster one, there's no other things, just the intensity difference. If you have a string, if you have a tilt, their position gonna be different, but uh, we don't have that. We only have intensity difference. So, uh, Chu Tao generated a real space map. It looks pretty random. And uh, he generated a manifold structure, and it looks like a ball with three parts. Okay, I said, I'm even more confused after like, uh, looking at this result. So we get this in 2020 during the COVID, and uh, that's when I just moved to RISE. And um, so I said, is that real? So we look at the raw data from the clusters. It's actually, if you see, uh, I'm not sure whether it's clear enough, but if you see those diffraction patterns, they do have a tendency to have a one direction is like a more, so in this class, it's like, okay, this direction, this direction is more like um, polar, polarity than the other two directions. They do exist in the sample. 
So what is that? We still don't know. After two years, we still didn't figure, uh, don't figure out like what this is. So if anyone, any, I know you guys are all experts. If you have any clue, please let us know. That's going to be very, very helpful. And okay, so I know this video is on YouTube. So any audience from YouTube, if you know the answer, let us discuss. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's uh, so my uh, my data was always on like a one triangles, and there's a lot of interesting structures. But most of the time. Uh, when like uh, people grow the sample, they form the nucleate at the center, and then grow different uh, like uh, single crystals, and they have different orientations. So this is the rotation that uh, uh, Holly mentioned. This has no physical meanings. It's just like a, a random rotation, right? We, we don't care about the rotation. We care about the what happened in this uh, lattice structure. So uh, we have a collaboration uh, with Josh Arger. And Colin, Colin simulate this, <laughs> this uh, some data for this work. So they uh, use auto encoder to distinguish the string from the rotation, and uh, simply distinguishing this, uh, uh, like you can see from the diffraction pattern, this is uh, uh, like a lattice constant are different, and this is the rotation. So simply separating these two going to be very helpful for uh, more general and uh, large scale and high throughputs uh, for 4 DSTAM data an analysis. So how that work on experimental data? So I do have a 4 DSTAM data when I was at Cornell on this uh, super lattice narrow junction uh, with multiple triangles. So this is the, uh, uh, when, when they show, uh, the, this is the rotation. And uh, it actually pick up uh, this uh, rotation uh, very nicely. And then when they show me the string, I was like, wow, this is good. It's like uh, you don't have a rotation in this uh, triangle. You purely see the super lattice. This is pretty uh, small uh, changes of the uh, lattice, and they pick it up very nicely. And I do want to point it out that if you do rotation invariant, don't throw out this rotation information. If you see here, that's a very interesting structure within one flake and the large rotations. And actually, these rotations are caused by some like rippling up and folding of this triangle uh, in the center. And uh, then uh, that actually introduced, I think that forms during the transfer process when we uh, like uh, release the sample from the substrate and put it on another TM grade and uh, bake off the PMMA or anything. And their internal strain are released and form this structure. Yeah, so the rotation do have uh, important information. So, yeah. So we want to try the machine learning method for like, uh, like uh, other projects because this is fast, this can tell us information. Why not? We just use it as a pre-process be before like uh, any serious analysis on the real data. And uh, so we try it with another sample we got from MIT. Uh, so this is a two-dimensional ferroelectric material. And it's very interesting, uh, and it's uh, ferroelectricity is coupled with this uh, uh, ferroelastic string in the lattice. And from the top view, you can see the displacement of this tin and the selenium atom uh, introduce this uh, polarization in the sample. So the sample is grown on mica substrate, and we find a thin flake, transfer it on this uh, whole, uh, this uh, 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 like a carbon film uh, TEM grade, and uh, uh, then we took 40 cm data of this flake, the specific flake here, which is thin, very thin, and we can see the diffraction patterns from each uh, uh, like a pixel, and we run the algorithm. So, so we actually pick this center area. So I want to point it out. Okay, we, we pick this center area. We do have a larger, uh, like uh, the whole flake uh, for the data and we run it. Also interesting, but uh, this is clearer. So we pick this uh, data and run it and uh, it's quite interesting. So it has uh, super domains. We call it super domains. That's actually after we analysis, we know it's super domains. So this like a two, uh, one and two, uh, they, 
form this uh, boundary uh, because their stripe are uh, in different orientations. And then we do further clustering, we see the stripe domains coming up. We say, okay, this sample has a very interesting structure. And if we look at the diffraction uh, from different, average diffraction from different clusters, we know, okay, this, uh, like we call it vertical domain and horizontal domain, and they are twin boundaries. And uh, vertical uh, between these uh, super, uh, super domains, there are a large rotation angle, quite a large rotation angle between these two. And we know, okay, let's process the data. So you may already notice this, uh, this spot show you the most difference. So let's use this spot to uh, put a mask there and do some measurements. So we put the mask on this uh, two O, sorry, we put the mask on this two O spots. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so, and then we do some uh, like a calculation. Uh, this here, this uh, prior knowledge came in. We know the lattice and it has uh, two polarization directions and it's gonna change the shape from square to this rhombohedral. And we map the fire elastic string and uh, uh, this rotation. And it has actually has a really quite large rotation, make the super domain boundary very interesting. Okay, so we look at the super domain boundary and we did some phase field, uh, phase field uh, uh, simulation. And uh, we also look closer into a T-junction and Chu Chao did some further analysis working on this uh, difference between this from diffraction pattern and figure out the lattice distortion happened uh, here near this uh, T-junction. And we also identified uh, that the T-junction actually can change because when we change the width of this uh, top um, like a uh, stripe and when it's pretty wide, they actually uh, form needle tip structure rather than a, a uh, like attach the T-junction. We did some statistics and we find that this uh, type one uh, shows here, uh, gonna like have a similar, similar uh, like effect where this uh, stripe, a vertical stripe affect the string in this uh, horizontal stripes. And at some critical width, it suddenly starts to form this uh, needle tip and uh, there's uh, like a bigger gap between these two. So we're still trying to understand this and uh, we're uh, preparing the manuscript now. Okay, so it's a summary for the machine learning part. And I'm gonna quickly talk about the crowd yet part. And uh, so we, um, we find machine learning is very useful, very, very helpful actually. And then we uh, worked on this uh, hierarchical clustering and it gave us um, uh, good information. And uh, it's actually a pre-screening of the data and tell us what might be interesting in your sample. And uh, by using that, we uh, help us to improve the mapping strategy such as we can quantify repos now, uh, we can map the fire electric domain in a more efficient way. And we also, it also uncovers unexpected features like this uh, very odd polar polarity intensity in the first order diffraction uh, spots. And uh, uh, there's like a definitely opportunities for better clustering algorithms or unsupervised learning algorithms to help us uh, to further simplify this process. Okay, oh, another project we work on um, related to machine learning is that <laughs> Uh, for uh, tachography, we like we, we all know. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, several like uh, introduction for to tachography. So I guess you guys already know that. So it has a very give you have a high resolution, and um, we think the problem actually in tachography from another angle is that if you want to uh, if you want to if you look at this uh, workflow, uh, it's actually very important to choose parameters correctly to get a good tachography reconstruction in electron microscope. And uh, it's not only reconstruction parameters, it also is experimental parameters. And so my postdoc, Michael, uh, worked with uh, Yi Jiang and uh, Zhen Chen, uh, work on this uh, using Bayesian optimization with Gaussian process to help improve the parameter uh, like a selection, uh, parameter tuning in tachography. And uh, they use this workflow and uh, we borrowed the data actually we took uh, at Cornell and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a two layer, uh, two layer um, MOS2 on top of MOSE2 so there's some Moyer pattern. And uh, we borrow this data and uh, then we run our algorithm and we found, okay, the reconstruction is pretty comparable to what uh, uh, E has did uh, in his uh, nature paper. 
And uh, we think this uh, definitely uh, very helpful for like a human out of loop parameter tuning and uh, parameter selection for exper not only data processing but also experiments. If we can run things very fast, we can even do like a online parameter tuning for uh, experiments. That's the ideal like uh, like uh, thing. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly talk about the CrowEM part. And uh, CrowEM uh, operate in TEM mode, and uh, uh, it's very, very important. And uh, so the CrowEM workflow uh, starts from sample preparation, and then uh, people put the sample in TEM to collect the data, and then do a very, uh, use a various method for data processing. So uh, there's a lot of like mathematicians working in uh, improving the data processing to select particles, do the classification, and uh, get the final structure. Yeah. So we actually come into help CrowEM community from a different angle. We actually utilize 2T materials to help the sample preparation. Okay, so here I want to highlight, if you talk about uh, talk with uh, uh, biochemists, like uh, their work, so 90% of their work is on the sample preparation. And uh, data collection and data processing is similar. And uh, I think that's definitely like, uh, uh, that's definitely uh, grateful, uh, because, grateful to those uh, mathematicians who help to improve the algorithm. Okay, so sample preparation, they spend so long time to purify the sample. And finally, when they put it on the TM grid, they find, okay, my sample aggregates at the ring, uh, at the edge, or a sample attached to this carbon film, or have a preferred orientation, I can't get 3D reconstruction. And they really struggle because the sample are wasted and they need to figure out a way to solve all these problems. So one of the solution is to have a very thin layer of film, electron transparent film, and uh, to support the, uh, the, the solution layer, and uh, then make it uh, get a very uniform layer. So graphene is definitely the best uh, electron transparent film for these applications. So, but graphene is hydrophobic. If you put protein on graphene, that's what happens. Protein aggregates. And some like a wrinkle area may uh, feel protein attached to it. So there's existing techniques, uh, uh, for example, using low power hydrogen plasma uh, to uh, solve the problem, or using this uh, graphene oxide floating on surface of water. But they have certain limitations, like uh, uh, very require very expensive instruments and uh, uh, not a fully coverage of this uh, film. You can buy commercially gra gra graphene oxide or graph graphene grids, and you will find they're so dirty. And uh, they, if you store graphene in air, it's going to get dirty after a week. We, my student tested that. And uh, so if you want to uh, do good cryo-EM, you need a very clean graphene. So that's why I developed this. Uh, uh, we uh, actually want to demonstrate a very simple method that can help cryo-EM community to get graphene grids and fresh graphene grids. So we cover graphing with uh, uh, the, this co copolymer and uh, then uh, transfer it onto TM grade and uh, clean off the copolymer using acetone IPA. And then we functionalize graphing surface using UV ozone. And you will have a functionalized graphing which is hydrophilic. And um, uh, there's a very large coverage. So I have to show uh, the structural biologists or cryo-EM labs, those tools, they are simple. So you can buy it within like $5,000 and then do the graphing grades in your lab. And um, there's uh, advantages of this uh, using this method. And uh, so first of all, we have a very high yield. We have uh, uh, all the holes here are with suspended graphings. You don't need to waste your cryo-EM data. And the UV ozone help us to uh, like uh, make graphene hydrophilic, and this parameter is works the best. And uh, then the, here's the results. So with graphene, we see we actually see the rippling of graphene in the cryo-EM a little bit. So without graphene, the proteins are hanging around, maybe attached to the air-water interface. But with graphene, so the proteins attached to the graphene surface and greatly increase this uh, density of protein particles for a single particle reconstruction. And uh, using the data, we only collect a little bit of data, and we can get a very high resolution apoferritin reconstruction. And another advantage is that this helps to solve the preferred orientation issue and the small protein issue. So this 
protein is uh, very small, uh, like uh, uh, is uh, is uh, very small. So if you have a very thick ice layer, it's not going to show ma much contrast. But using graphene, you can see that uh, the protein particle very nicely, and you can even see in FFT we have the graphene reciprocal lattice highlighted. And uh, we did the reconstruction and get a structure. And that this is the highest resolution of the structure of the smallest protein uh, when the paper was published. And I think this convinced most of the cryoEM lab that the graphing grids actually works, works very well. And uh, okay, so it ha can ha not only help a soluble protein, like a biochemist. Uh, Put a membrane protein in lipid uh, in this uh, detergent uh, detergent uh, micelles and uh, liposomes and the graphene grids can help improve the intensity as well. And one of my colleague using the graphene grids to get a structure of this ACRB embedded in a liposome, which is a lipid bilayer environment, a very na uh, more natural environment for a membrane protein. And he can even figure out that for this two. Uh, to declassification, this uh, curvature of the liposome is changing, so they have different sides, and uh, then uh, this may add different, um, like a stress to the protein, and allow us to study the dynamic of the protein according to the like mechanical sensing proteins according to the uh, according to the curvature of the the, the, the membrane. Okay, so. Uh, finally, we not only use 2D material to help cryoEM, we also use cryoEM to study 2D materials that are synthesized in solution. So this is a 2D DNA origami uh, synthesized in solution, and it's a cross tile, and uh, every tile is a monolayer, uh, single strand DNA thickness uh, in the sample. So people used to use it to build like lattices on surface. And conventional way, uh, put it on a substrate is gonna be uh, AFM gonna be. You can see it's like a flat, flattened out. And uh, cryoEM shows up. This actually, they when they are in solution, they are pretty floppy. And uh, if you look, search for like a different area, you can see uh, they are not only floppy. They are like uh, forming clusters and stacks in the solution. And we even find a trimer where they actually design this uh, this uh, ends, so the DNA strands gonna bind to another uh, like uh, cross tile. Then this trimer has a folding strand here, which actually doing the work to fold one of the uh, one of this uh, cross tile uh, like a bandit. So this paper was published in iScience um, this year. And I want to show you, we do have a tomography, but it's super noisy. So uh, we do see a cross tile, floppy cross tile in the tomography, uh, tomogram we got. Uh, but it's very, like, uh, because of the low signal noise ratio, it's very noisy. If there's like any machine learning method can improve uh, tomography, that will be very, very good. Yeah. So finally, uh, I want to do a summary. We work on 2D materials and using 4DCM and cryoEM. We also work on machine learning methods to help simplify this uh, uh, process. And I want to thank my group. And this is my group website. If you're interested, you can uh, like, uh, uh, look at our works. And uh, thank my PhD group, postdoc group, and all these uh, very fantastic collaborators. Thank you.